you know what? Right into it. Right into it. I can't wait around for loading. I can't wait around for anything. I just need to draw. Reese Layden. It's far too early for Reese. Rest well. Hello, Artistic Spartan. Just in time to get through work. Excellent. Excellent. It's been a while since I've done this. Uh, how does it sound? Is the setup okay? Let me nudge my camera here a little bit. Nothing to do about my overhead cam being significantly in the shot, at least not right now, not without reconfiguring everything. <clears throat> Let me zoom in a little. Check the focus. Feels like even if you're not really like changing anything about the setup, whenever you take any kind of break, everything kind of crumbles. Everything sounds great, good. Emma Blomskog, hello. Drink Woter, hello. Dino Blaster, Samajic Kennen, Soko, Tet, Paul King Motion. How's everybody doing? I'm back, baby. Took a nice break. Easing right into things. He's in right on into streaming and drawing. I do have a plan for what I'm going to sit here and draw for a little bit, but I'm always open to letting myself diverge. My uh, next drawing. I feel like I want to do a really big drawing of a, a tree. Well, not, not really a, a tree, but you know, for all intents and purposes, a tree. And uh, I want to design that, look for ideas for that. So I'm just sketchbooking. Just going to draw a bunch of wild forms. Fall in love with some initial things, hopefully. Give me something to go research and look for analogs for. I want to do it. Uh, I want it to be my first drawing ever, or at least I want. I want it to be basically my first finished drawing that's larger than eighteen by twenty-four inches. I've technically done drawings bigger than that, but not uh, not like really nicely finished ones that I sort of show and put out there on social media. There's a couple out there, but they weren't really. They were basically just giant sketches. They weren't like finished drawings. Did you travel light speed and get older than us faster or vice versa? What is that supposed to be a, a reference to? to the beard aging me. You guys always fall for it. Whenever I shave the beard, you guys are always like, oh, Steven, oh, you look like baby. Oh, you look so much younger. And then as soon as the beard grows out, you guys are like, Steven truly is an old man, the aged sage of drawing. He has seen so many things in his journey of drawing through the long, long years. My goodness. It really is true that he is old and irrelevant. He does not understand the current trends, the tiggy toggy, the enemies. He is a dinosaur, but we cannot deny that there is some ancient skill there, irrelevant and uninteresting as it may be. Have you read Berserk? If you have, what are your thoughts on it? I remember you mentioning Kentaro Miura. Uh, I have not read it, like the whole thing. 
Hold on, let me uh, let me move my monitor that I have. This is gonna rattle everything. I just want chat a little more in my eye line. There you go. I don't think that messed up anything. I see it shook my webcam enough that I'm out of focus. Okay. Hello, Boxer Wing. Tiggy Toggy? Yeah, you know the Tiggy Toggy. Ain't that where you guys like to watch your cat videos now? I've been old and decrepit long enough now, seen enough social medias rise and fall like the Roman Empire that I know now, now I see it, all the different social medias, everything they say, oh, this one's a new paradigm, oh, this one's a new thing, oh, this changes the meta for what people are interested in watching, ba ba da ba da ba da MySpace, Facebook, Zanga, Tiggy Toggy, Instagram. It's all, all, all each one is is just, this is where people watch their cat videos now. That's it. It's just, this is the current place to watch cat videos. That's all it is. None of them are important. And none of them are special and none of them are different. <laughs> it's just this is the place where people watch their cat videos now. What advice do you have with regard to using the stump? When I use it and even when I follow the form and draw with it, it still ends up muddy somehow. Well, those two things are the main advice that people, that I usually give. You gotta draw with it and you gotta follow the form. But if it's looking muddy even when you do that, it's probably because you're not rendering light there's lots of ways to render light, but the most common way is to actually follow the rules of light, the physics of light. Uh, when you follow the physics of light, you create the modeling factors in most situations. And if you are not doing that, if you're not creating the modeling factors, if you are not actually producing lighting, then it's gonna look muddy. Create clear shapes of light and shadow. And if you go farther than just the overall shapes of light and shadow, make sure that each modeling factor within the light shape and the shadow shape is distinct. Distinct. It's value well chosen. Everybody happy, moisturized in their lane. Hello Armando, how are you doing today? I'm good, I'm good, I'm back to streaming. Trying to get back into it, easing right back in. After Nightshade All Night, I pulled the trigger on taking a little break from AI stuff. Really wound up taking a, a break from most things. You know, breaks are important. Most like online high output things. I thought I'd take a rest from that. So that was early February. So not quite two months, but something like two months, a month and a half. Took a nice little break, rested a lot. Still drew, of course, and all that. But, you know, with some of the time that I opened up, spent more time thinking, writing, got back to making YouTube videos in the traditional style of this channel, meditated more, spent more time on walks, spent more time doing utterly nothing, laying around with my dog. Just letting the body unwind its little healing process that it does. Finally got to finish a new pencil drawing. That felt good.
I'd like to ask a question, says TL. How do you manage to switch between big sheets of paper size and the sketchbook? I feel I can only draw one size and feels constrained in sketchbooks. Well, going smaller isn't a problem, but going big is. So I would recommend you, um, I recommend you get used to working big. It makes sense that you feel constrained to the small sketchbook size. If you get used to working big, it, it won't be a problem to return to sketchbook size at all, at least not for most people. Um, speaking of big, that reminds me, just because I got it here. Here's the pencil drawing I got to finish on my break. The Demiurge creates Adam. I know you can't see it, it's all glared out at this angle on my webcam, but I like to show it just to remind people like how big they actually are. You know, they're bigger than you think. I can't. You know, here's my head next to it. You know, my head is about 200 inches tall, so. And be careful to not show the very bottom where the questionable bits are on stream. <clears throat> More of the process for that one will wind up on uh, some upcoming YouTube video. There, uh, it'll be carefully censored by my dear editor, so. Ted says, have you watched Dune? I saw the first one, I have not seen the second one yet. <clears throat> is it still in theaters or is it out of theaters? All right. Still in theaters, it was pretty good. Yeah, I gotta check it out. Yes, my wife would wanna come with me and she's in a very busy period right now. It would be difficult for her to make time at the moment. Oh, give me land, lots of land, under starry skies above, don't fence me in. She always comes when I sing. She always comes when I sing. I know, I know. I know. But when you jump up like that, you shake the camera. You do, you rattle the whole table. I love you, you're a good little dog. You're a good little dog. Now go on, get out of here, go to bed, go to bed. Steven, have you read a book called Art and Fear by David Bales and Ted Orland? Uh, I have, it would have been, would have been several years ago now. I don't remember it super well, I, I read it and art, the war of art. I read that one and the war of art sort of back to back and they kind of blend together in my head because I read them back to back.
I remember liking both generally. I also remember that the main advice in both was the perennial advice that artists just always need to hear over and over and over again, which is just make the damn thing. That's it. That's the whole advice. <laughs> Smodjik says, how does an average day for you look like? Are you working on any commission work or personal projects? Uh, I am working on personal projects, a uh, few things. I'm working on a project with my buddy Joe. Uh, that is a graphic novel, comic book. I am also recording the process for making that for the design process for that, not the, we haven't gone into production yet. We're writing the scripts and doing the pre-production, but I'm recording the process of the pre-production to turn into a course on production design. Um, and I'm also doing this stuff, my personal drawing practice, always trying to just keep that system going. Keep making my pictures for myself. What does an average day look like for me? Uh, you know, it varies a lot, um, which I think is fun. Like one of the pleasures of being, one of the pleasures of making your living as an artist on your own, if you're into it, if it's not just <laughs> horrifying for you, um, is that you really have a, a very structureless life. Like you need to take all of your structures upon yourself. You know, you need to invent how you wanna live your life. And one of the joys of that, I think, is getting to experiment. So I go through seasons and I change the way that I live quite often, you know? I go through periods where I do most of my work at the beginning of the day. Then I'll go through a period where I do most of my work in the second half of my day. Generally, beginning of the day, I like more. Um, you know, I just play with every aspect of my day to day. If I had to give a general, a general answer is like, usually I wake up around 6.30, somewhere between 6.30 and seven. Um, I have coffee and either read or draw in my sketchbook. Uh, my morning coffee time is very precious to me. Then I will usually meditate for some period, uh, I like to do at least 20 minutes. Sometimes it goes up to an hour or something like that. Then I will do life stuff, walk the dog, eat breakfast. Uh, if I have any like correspondence, you know, emails that need my attention, um, you know, guiding my editor on something, I'll do that there. And then somewhere around nine, somewhere between nine and 10, I will sit down and I will try to just work, just do like deep work. Um, it's funny to call it deep work when it's just how people have worked for most of history before we entered this period where we're all horribly distracted and have our phones on us all the time. Um, I'll do that till around 12 or one. So I usually try to get in like three or four hours. That's harder when I'm in the beginning stages of things and then very easy for long periods once I'm stuck in on a project. Like that drawing that I showed earlier, took about a month to draw. So sitting and doing three hours of good work when I'm trying to find that drawing is tough. And then, you know, after that like week long period where that's tough, once I'm just committed to the drawing, that's a month of it's very easy to sit down and work on it for three-ish hours every day. Um, then I eat lunch. Then I usually get some exercise, you know, go for a run, something like that. 
Come back, work a little bit. This is usually where I do like my feedback for my course, for my students. So this is probably now we're in like three to 5 p.m., something like that. Around five, I will then cook dinner uh, before my wife gets home. Uh, then my wife will get home, we'll eat dinner, and then I usually follow what she's gotta do there. So if she has work she needs to do after she gets home from work, um, you know, stuff she's gotta finish up at home, I'll usually keep working too, drawing, stuff like that. And if she's open, we just hang out, you know, take some time to be a person. And that's a general day because, you know, that's a day where like drawing is number one priority. I have days where that's not necessarily number one priority. I'll still do it. But some days the deep work hours need to go to making a video, writing a script. Um, if I'm like really behind on feedback for some reason, uh, that will just get my prime working hours, things like that. How do you draw water? Start dark, start dark. Soko says 20 minutes, holy moly. My 10 minutes of meditation feels like 10 minutes of counting the time down. Yeah, I know that. Just stick with it. That changes. That changes. Well, I mean, I still, I personally still have days like that, but I would say they're not the general character of it anymore, but. I don't think those days go away completely. <laughs> Mine's a relentless little rat. Ellis Stevens says, glad to see you're back. Happy to be back. Do you ever feel stuck in the same corners in your life? If so, how do you cope with it? Stuck. Never feel stuck in the same corners of my life. Um, I don't feel stuck. I mean, like anybody, there's definitely times where the, the days can feel repetitive, you know? But um, that's not really that huge a deal. Like. I think that's the case for most people. I mean, it's <laughs> almost everybody, if they have a stable life, usually they've stabilized it by making some significant portion of their life quite repetitive. You know, everybody gets on a routine. It's the, it's the rare person who's living a very different life day to day. Uh, so I don't worry about that, even if it can hurt in the moment sometimes. Um, but stuck... I don't really feel stuck. I think that's mostly because I have a, sorry, let me move something here. Uh, I think that's mostly because my, what I do day to day, to day feels aligned with my values, you know? So if, if that's not the case for you, that might be a place to start. You know, I know that's a tough road to hoe because that means changing your job for a lot of people, changing your habits, changing your day to day. But yeah, I don't really feel stuck. I mean, I, I truly feel like 
most of the time I feel like I'm doing the right thing. Like I, e even if it's hard, even if I'm frustrated in the moment, I feel like I am on the right track. I just need to stick with it, you know? Playing with like, do I want to do it more upright, like these two? Do I want to allow it to get more horizontal, like a bonsai tree or something like that? I, I, I've played with this before, but I've never found a way to resolve this. But I like the overall value pattern of this design. This is not the first time I've sketched a design like this before. It makes for a very odd tree, right? It's like the the twigs and branches very neatly hold the mass of foliage inside of this like cage of branches. And I really like that as a design. I mean, it's obviously completely unrealistic. No tree or bush looks like that, but if I could find some way to resolve that, I really like it as a value pattern, especially when the branches are light and the foliage is dark. There's something there. Do you ever use multiple light sources in your pencil work? Sometimes, but honestly, not not typically. I like the clarity of a single light source. It, it really just lets me focus on modeling the form. And you usually even even when you do that, there is technically, if you if you analyze the drawing and what you've done, there is really multiple light sources because, you know, usually you pop a little rim light in there somewhere to explain something in the shadows. But I wouldn't say it's the, it's not primary, the multiple lights. Will there be another stream with Ahmed? The last one was lovely. Uh, the stream that I did with him, well, he doesn't live in New York. We don't live near each other, so. That's dependent on when he or I visit, and it's dependent on if when we do that visit, there is an opportunity to be in the studio. Hello, Renola. How you doing? Aka Botan says, Hello, Stephen. Is it normal to draw without deep focus and just go about it thinking random stuff while I still improve in a good pace? Um, it depends what you mean by random stuff. I, I mean, there's always going to be just thoughts floating in and out of the mind. Like when, when I say deep focus, I don't mean that for three hours, I've sort of achieved an enlightened, perfect meditative state where I only think on the drawing. Uh, I'm not sure that's possible. <laughs> um, there's always intrusive thoughts coming in and out. Intrusive characterizes them as negative. Those are there too, but a lot of times just like random nonsense, just like, what, what am I going to cook for dinner? Um, 
asking myself stupid questions, things like that. Like that's always there. And that's normal. You only need to watch out for the thoughts that try to drive you from the drawing board, the truly negative ones. The ones that like after you've been sitting for five minutes, they start saying, well, this isn't good enough. We should go do something else. Like those are the ones you need to not do anything about. You just need to be prepared to ignore them, see them for what they are, random and foolish. You know the difference though. I mean, m most people know the difference between being focused and not being focused. You know when you've spent a session sort of changing your playlist and looking for YouTube videos and... You know it when it happens, you know. What time zone is this? I'm in New York City, so Eastern time. Ty Tired Aneo says, here's a random question. How do I consume more things that inspire me? I feel that most of the stuff I consume is secondhand because of the internet, which is sort of unfortunate. So how should I? I think a lot of artists regularly need to detox from consumption. You know, you're, you need to reconnect with the part of you that's a producer rather than a consumer. I don't think it needs to be forever, but I think if you've never tried it, you should try it. And I don't know, I, I think a lot of artists kind of need to make a, a regular habit of it. You know, they'll do it for, you know, once a year or something like that. Just commit yourself for a period to, you know, you want to see something, you've got to either go find it in the world or better yet, you need to make it yourself. Lassie talks about art, says, I need some advice. All my thoughts in my free time right now revolve around the decision if I want to do a huge 3D animated short film project with some friends, which does not involve drawing and painting and would have a process that would be not so enjoyable and at times grueling, but I would love the end result. Or if I want to focus my time on enjoying drawing and painting and somehow making a living out of that at some point where I would enjoy the processes fully and the end result just most of the time. I feel like the short film gives me the opportunity to tell more of a story while drawing and painting is just experientially more enjoyable, but wouldn't tell a bigger narrative. So I am kind of torn between which is more important to do for myself and potential audiences. I apologize for the long question. Um, this may feel like a bit of an unsatisfactory answer, but you know, I don't know you personally, so there's only so good my so good my advice could be on this count. But like either is valid. Your life will be fine if you do either. Don't don't carry the decision too heavily. You know, you're, everything's going to be fine, no matter which one you do. Uh, you know, I can say that because you, you didn't put any financial. Um, or many financial considerations on either of those choices. So just remember that it, it, it's not about what you do, it's about that you did it. You know, the, the value that is put on our decisions is sort of synonymous with 
all of the things we didn't choose, you know, all of the opportunities that our choices and our focus close off is also part of what adds value to them. Um, so either is fine. Either is fine. And either is probably going to push you to a value, more valuable place. You know, either sounds like you are pushing yourself into a new chapter in life or you're trying to do something big. So either is going to be fine. Now from there, how you're going to choose which one to do, well, that's always got to be super personal. Me and no other rando on the internet is going to be able to help you with that. You know, you've got to make that choice yourself. How you make that choice, nobody knows. One day you'll just make it. It's true. One day you'll just make it. You're, you're sitting there weighing pros and cons right now and making little lists in your head. But on the day that you choose, it'll just happen. <laughs> That's how choices always happen. Alka Frazen says, in my opinion, how much is your time worth to you and how long does it take on average to complete a work? These two factors determine your prices. Oh, I see you're talking to someone else. Never mind. Never, never mind. What's your favorite way of getting bored or detoxing? Uh, when I need to rest, I like to uh, meditate or read. Those are my two favorites. A long walk is also wonderful. Especially if there's a spot in the middle of the walk where I can buy a donut and a coffee. Where's the line between reference and plagiarism? I've seen artworks get plagiarism allegations just because of a similar pose or angle to something pre-existing. Um, the line is drawn in court. I don't know, the topic is just too broad, you know? It's, it's very subjective until it goes to court. Lots of people don't think they're plagiarizing. And then they put it out there and everyone's like, what the fuck, man, you plagiarized this. And they're like, oh, shit, I guess I did. <laughs> See, that happened to a lot of people. Like, you just, you know, you let yourself slip, you lose focus, it happens. It's like, it's in court. So when, once damages are awarded, now we know it was plagiarism. <laughs>
Jan Tamba says, Stirvin's a perpies. See your broccoli has grown much more bigger last I saw you. Yeah, it's getting pretty big, right? I forget what it looked like last time I was on. Pretty big. I always find a way to just make it all arms. I just love drawing arms so much. <laughs> I don't know how you can grow your hair out like that. I hate hair so much. The moment I leave high school, I'm gonna go bald by choice. It won't last long. I mean, I I can grow it out when it's uh, cold out. Once it gets hot, I I can't have, I can't stand it because uh, you know it sticks to my head on runs and things like that. I just I'll try, but it it never holds up. I always wind up cutting it down, shaving the facial hair. It's cold season, Stephen. It's fun to grow out while the weather's amenable. And you know, I don't I don't have a job I go to so I can, I can look as crazy as I want. <laughs> you know, if you get the chance, you might as well. Might as well take advantage. Missed opportunity if not.
You should get it long enough so you could tie it. I could tie it now. I could, well, I guess the, the bun or the pony would be in a bit of a weird position, but I could tie it. I just don't like tying it. That, that, uh, that annoys me more than having the big fro on my head. Sort of feeling my hair pulled back like that annoys me. I'm a very sensitive boy, don't you know? Very sensitive little boy. No good, AI has crept into the chat. I'm just gonna ignore all AI discussion for now. If you're going to debate with each other, please be civil. You're not gonna get any responses from me on it. I've said my piece. <laughs> I've got a openly anti-AI video that's got some 700,000 or close to that views on it now. My, my opinion's out there. I'm not gonna talk about it on here. Not today. Relic says, do you have any tag on Instagram where your students flex with their art slash exercises? No, no, I don't have a tag like that. So, sometimes people post their assignments from my course um, with the form from imag with the tag form from imagination, it's the name of the course. But I don't ask them to do that or anything like that. I haven't like formalized that tag. I don't feel the uh, I don't feel the impulse to take even a shadow of ownership of the achievements of my students. <laughs> Got any tips for fingers and hands? I always have trouble making them look human, which is what I'm aiming for. I mean, they're, there's no easy tips. I mean, they're, they're famously hard to draw, right? Uh, the main thing I would say is that there is another side. You, you can practice them enough where they just become fun again. Um, especially on a finished drawing, doing the hands is often some of my favorite parts of finishing the, the drawing. Um, tips. Uh, there's very few generalizable tips. The There's some general uh, proportional canons that people teach. You can find them in any book that purports to teach drawing hands, but like from the wrist to the knuckle is half. And then if you take the half and go up, that's the end of the ring finger. And then people vary these proportions, but like if you take half of that, it's the first knuckle on the ring finger. You take half of that, that's the second knuckle, even though people play with thirds and stuff like that on those proportions. The thing is with all proportional canons like that, which can be a little useful when laying things in, is that perspective and all of that and poses mess all of that up. There's only so far as those things will go. But that said, it's a good basic thing to know. Like even if you're doing like a hand and side view, you can sort of start by doing two little line segments even if they're bent. The line segments, if they're roughly the same length, you know that like the knuckle 
of the ring finger will wind up there and then your ring finger, see even there, it's like, well, the ring finger is weirdly straight, right? But that gives you a general proportion for a hand inside of you, right? But then you've got to build all the other fingers and stuff like that um, outside of those cannons. So it's a good thing to keep in mind, but you don't, you don't draw like that. You use that to diagnose the situation as you work. Always go for freedom, feel, happiness, looseness, you know, just prioritize drawing rather than analytically analyzing uh, things like proportions and things like that. And sometimes you just gotta, you know, get into the nitty gritty and draw every finger. Oster says, Stephen, I'm very disappointed because I've said hello out loud while watching one of your old live streams and you didn't answer me. So much for communicating with your audience, huh? That is a failing on my part. I will have to, I will have to share that feedback with my manager. I'll, I'll yell it at my manager. I'll say, why don't we have live listening microphone feeds in the home of everyone in the audience so that when they say hello to me, to their screen, out loud, we can retroactively edit the content of the stream so that I immediately respond, hello. And if he can't figure it out, I'll fire him. Janos Gerash, how are you? Love the hair, thank you, Janos. How you doing, man? Hope all is well. Janos has a very helpful YouTube channel on entertainment design. If you're looking for concept art tips, go check out Janos's channel. Focusing mostly on the wood here. I need to figure out how I want to integrate this foliage. And the sweet, sweet process of drawing, of happily drawing stirth. Just looking for ways to make the hatches interact overall value patterns to interact. Ooh, that sound. <laughs> Ooh, baby. The sound of the pencil scratching the paper. The original ASMR. I have a Pavlovian reaction to that at this point. Yano says, I'm good, just chilling in my break at the moment. How are you? We haven't talked for long. I'm good, man. I'm good. I just took a nice break myself. I was still, you know, drawn and stuff like that, but took a break from streaming and being too online, doing too much stuff. Rewound to basics for about a month and a half, two months there. It was really, really nice. Good rest. See, Janos knows you gotta take your rests. You gotta take your breaks. Got to take our own advice too. I'm always telling 
people on stream and students and stuff like that, like take a break if you feel all messed up. <laughs> if you feel tired, take a break. Don't worry about it. Can't be telling people to do that and then find I'm unwilling to do it. So I take my breaks and I take them competitively. Ooh, I'm, I'm good at relaxing. I'm good at taking breaks. And I'm a superior break taker. Your relaxation is inferior to mine. Anna Rude says, Stephen, finally, I'm making finished art again regularly after almost two years. It's so exciting. Oh, I love it. Congratulations. Congratulations. Stephen, should I just copy Bridgman book multiple times for my knowledge on anatomy while drawing real people from reference to get better at figure drawing? I don't recommend Bridgman for most people. Um, I've copied Bridgman. I think Bridgman is, is great. I don't think he's someone to look at if you don't already know what you're doing. There's, there's much better resources for anatomy knowledge and form knowledge um, than Bridgman these days. There's much clearer. Um, there's anatomy, which is basically what can be written about the human body in a medical textbook, right? You can technically learn anatomy strictly construed without ever seeing a picture. Right? You can just read detailed descriptions of muscle shapes, origins, insertions, things like that. The, the body is understood specifically enough that that is actually possible. And a lot of the older anatomical books are really mostly that because they couldn't afford to print that many plates. Um, there is another part of anatomy, which is the part you would want pictures for, which is form, understanding form, how all of that information comes together into big masses that interlock. Uh, that is what Bridgman is good at. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's ancient material at this point. P people have done it better. Um, I think probably copying Frazetta's is probably a better education at this point than copying Bridgman's scratchy, poorly reproduced diagrams. Um, yeah, you know, and there's teachers like Michael Hampton out there who teach form and structure much more clearly, you know, with modern <laughs> high-res <laughs> video and diagrams rather than, um, rather than, yeah, those scratchy Bridgman drawings. Again, I love them, you know, and there is a certain magic there that is nowhere else, but it's for, I think it's for intermediates and advanced people to study. I, I think it doesn't do that much for beginners. Probably the most useful thing that it does for beginners is that it just teaches you to draw a little bit more dare to care. Art Dad says, do you find it's common to have skill proficiency shift with priorities? I'm working to get my 3D skills up to snuff for my career. Now it seems like drawing is more difficult for me. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get a little bit of rust um, when you go do something else for a long time, but it shakes off. You just shake it off. You don't, you don't truly lose your progress in something like drawing. You need to get the hand back, but it doesn't really take uh, that long, you know? A couple days of heavy drawing will bring it back for most people, you know? It's in there, you know, it's in the body. And the big concepts, the mental concepts, not like you forgot them, you know? You remember, you might have to refresh yourself on a couple things, but if you practice them up to the point of integration, they're there, they're always there and the body knows them.
was wondering how do you keep yourself from overworking? I love, whoop, questions gone. Mizubi says, any good books on some art theory? I want to know all these calculations about plotting light and shadow and perspective. Um, if you want to know the calculations, which again, and Mizubi, you know, because you're taking the course and I talk about it in the course often, uh, I think most people don't actually want to know the calculations. And a lot of people who have gone through the effort of learning how to plot light and shadow and perspective, learn how to do it. And it takes a year to two years. And then literally as soon as they're done, they never use it again. <laughs> so I don't recommend it for most people. I think you really, you should only go through it if you know you need it. If you know the specific dream pictures that you want to do requ require them. Um, but if, if you do want to learn them, um, the books I recommend at this point are uh, Marcos Mateo Mestre's Framed Perspective 1 and 2. They do cover the technical stuff, not in as great a detail as um, something like How to Draw by Scott Robertson and Thomas Bertling, which is probably still the definitive modern textbook on the way people want to use it now. Um, all of this stuff, of course, you know, when I say the way people want to use it now, all this stuff comes from architecture. Architects were the first to figure out um, technical drafting. And they, I mean, they they resolved everything. They resolved all of it. Um, but there's very few people for whom that way of working is uh, relevant or desirable these days. Um, so how to draw has the more modern side of it. Uh, and it's more technically involved than framed perspective. But the good, what I like about framed perspective is that the technicals are there, but also in the book is the artistic stuff. He shows you, you see lots of sketches and practical applications of perspective to remind you that um, that's what you're supposed to be doing. How to Draw is, has some of that, but in my opinion, it's, I don't know, it's a bit lighter, you know, it, not lighter, uh, heavier, it like takes itself very seriously in some sense. Or I think frame perspective makes it much more clear that like, all right, he's just throwing figures in here, you know, he's just starting with a very high energy sketch. He's sort of working backwards based on his thumbs and things like that, and I think a lot of that is lost on people who just study How to Draw by Scott Robertson and Thomas Berling. Goodbye, Arknock. I'm supposed to pick up my kid at school, but this live is fire. Go get your kid. I'm sick of people abandoning their children to join my cult. It's not what I intended.
Hold on a second. Someone's ringing my doorbell. Sorry, folks. I normally would have let that go, but uh, I knew I had my giant bag of dog food getting delivered today. I didn't want to leave that on the stoop, blocking the way for my neighbor. And it was indeed the, uh, the giant bag of dog food. Lena says, man, I missed the beginning. How are you feeling, Steven? 
just fine. Ooh, baby. Thanks for asking, Lena. Jim Wool says, hey, Stephen, the broccoli upon your head seems to be continuously expanding. Are you preparing for a bountiful harvest? What will be most bountiful? Most bountiful. It will feed the entire kingdom. When the broccoli is redistributed, everyone will find themselves to be much the richer. Shady on Fire says, just got to know a little about the history of Zapata's people revolution in Mexico and following art movements to that. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. I tried to read the Wikipedia about, <laughs> about it once. It was a long time ago, though. I must admit that the history behind my namesake has long since fled me. Pretty wild stuff, though. Madrigal says, watching Steven feels like I'm improving myself. It's great, now I don't have to draw. It is I who will accrue all the improvement.
verse says, oh my God, he's alive. What's your opinion on the Hogarth Anatomy books? Are they suitable for study? I think so, yeah. You just have to accept that the, the way he draws in them is stylized for a reason. You know, he makes the points he's trying to make very clear. But some people are never going to be able to look through this, look past the stylization. They were some of the first anatomy or, I guess not technically anatomy, but like figure drawing books I ever read. <clears throat> I found them pretty early. It's really just the one, uh, Hogarth's dynamic figure drawing. It wasn't until many years later that I looked through the anatomy one, the straight up anatomy one. Goob says, Stephen, what is your antidote for when meaninglessness creeps into drawings? Increase the meaning. I mean, it may seem too obvious, but just draw shit you care about. You know, there's, there's always good reason to be drawing, right? Even if, the, even if the particular drawing that you're doing doesn't mean that much to you, right? You, there's always good reason you're iterating the ritual. You know, you're building the temple in your heart for when the next meaningful pieces come. You're hopefully feeling peace and calm while drawing, as opposed to being anxious and nervous, which in this insane world, any moment of peace is worth experiencing. But if those internal things are falling flat for you, you're just in one of those days. To be clear, I think it's very important that you be capable of being motivated by those internal things. I think that's essential for an artist. But if it's one of those days where you can't bring yourself to be motivated by those things, yeah, it's going to come down to what the hell are the drawings. And it's not like it's illegal to say, <laughs> but yeah, sometimes you're drawing stuff. You've allowed yourself to spend time drawing stuff that you don't care about, that nobody cares about. It does, just doesn't matter. You know, I, there's nothing but <laughs> things that really don't mean much, even to you. Forget what the audience thinks. The main problem is to you, right? It, it just doesn't mean much to you. You can't go on like that forever. You, you got to draw stuff you care about. If you don't care about it, why the hell would the audience care about it? They won't. I was doing a, I was recording the answers for my March Patreon Q&A yesterday, and one of them in there had a long answer to a similar topic to that that I think you'll want to listen to. I think that video will, the audio's done, all the questions are answered, but I think the video probably won't come out for another couple weeks, but if you remember, check that one out. I believe it's the last question that I answer is a long, long extrapolation on that topic. You should be drawing stuff you care about. That shouldn't be unusual. <laughs> Hey, Steven, are you religious? Uh, it's funny. I, I personally experience myself as hyper-religious. 
But my answer to your question must be no, not at all. If I explained if I explained the nature of my religiosity, there's there's no one in chat who would agree that I'm a religious person. And I I accept that and I acknowledge that. So no. But strangely, I, I basically feel like I practice my religion 16 hours a day. <laughs> I'm thinking about my religion from the moment I wake up to the end of the day. It's just like one of my top three priorities in my life. But again, you would, you would never agree with me if I got into the details. Have you ever been to THU? I have not. I'd like to sometime though. Looks fun. Create quality. <laughs> nice name. Says so Stephen, I found out the root of my art block is depression. Not situational depression, just one since birth. Been taking citalopram cita for three weeks and I'm still waiting to feel good but hopeful. I am hopeful too. I am hopeful too. Good for you, create quality. Happy to hear it. I wish you much happy drawing in the near future. Hey Steven, what is your current film setup? It looks great. Any tips to avoid camera getting in the way of drawing? Uh, so I, my setup is, uh, I'm, my camera is the GH5, the Lumix GH5, Lumix slash Panasonic, depending where you are. I use an Elgato cam link to go from the HDMI out on the camera straight into my computer, and I use OBS to stream. Um, as you can see, the camera is in the way. There's very few ways to avoid it in my experience. I think if you, I, I have an overhead rig that sits on my desk. It's a, it's like 20, the legs are like 25 inches apart. It's one that people use for like unboxing videos on YouTube. Um, I got this because uh, I used to live in a very small apartment, so I really didn't have room for anything else. I needed something relatively compact that I could tuck away. Um, but if you really wanted the camera to be out of the way, I think probably the best way would be to do a very large, like professional photographer's overhead rig, which would be um, the rig, instead of sitting on your desk, it the legs would be off your table. Like it's it'd be like a, seven foot wide overhead rig and the camera would wind up like six feet above your head or something like that. Um, I think that would probably be ideal and possibly the only way to keep the camera out of the shot. But yeah, I mean, with my rig, I mean, the camera's right there. You could see it in my face cam and there's really no way to avoid that 
completely. I, I kind of have it off to one side. I have my my well, my webcam in like a a bit of a sweet spot where it's like it sees mostly my face and it's missing my monitor, the wires, the overhead ring, and it's like that sweet spot is very narrow, very narrow. But it also doesn't need to be perfect, you know. I've been streaming for a long time and um, my setups have historically been much more ghetto than this one. Much, much, much more janky. I used to just, the webcam that is my face cam right now, You for a long time that's what I recorded with. That was my streaming cam and how I recorded videos and stuff like that. <clears throat> and I think, um, I think this webcam is, I might be wrong, but last I saw, this is the one that uh, Dave Finch, who's very big on YouTube, the uh, DC and Marvel comics artist. Is he Marvel? I forget. I think he does mostly DC. But um, he uses this webcam as his drawing cam. So, you know, you, you don't need, you know, the GH5, some prosumer, you know, crazy camera or anything like that. I like a I like a really high end camera specifically because I do pencils, and I do like a lot of subtle shading and things like that. And that's just like the hardest thing to get to look nice on camera. If I did like inks or stuff like that, I, you just wouldn't. I wouldn't need this camera at all. You know, they're just much more graphic and bold, and it's just it's easy to see them even with a webcam. But pencil, all the light grays, you got the graphite glare. A nice camera goes a uh, a long way. Hi, Yankee. I'm good. The wild Zapata bear emerges. Beard, Steven? Yeah, I'm gonna shave this off soon, probably. I, um... I do this unconsciously. I don't I don't choose to do this, but I I it happens every time when I'm finishing a drawing, which usually takes 3 weeks to a month, um which I just finished one. When I'm finishing an involved drawing, I stop shaving, and I don't know why. And then I shave once the drawing's done. It's like a it's like an irritating reminder to keep working on it on my face. Yeah, but I don't choose to do that. It just happens unconsciously. It's like a process my body enjoys running. So now that it's done, I'll I'll shave it off. I've just been lazy. I always do that. That always happens. Steven, do you like Dune? I like I like Dune fine. I, I never I never read the book. I started it a long time ago, but I don't think I got even halfway through. I'm really more of a Song of Ice and Fire kind of a guy. I think I saw Joe in here earlier. Hi, Joe. Was I imagining that? Oh, no, he's in there. Hi, Joe. What was your favorite artwork from the Nightshade stream? There was a few crazy ones in there. I would struggle to remember their names now, but there was some crazy, crazy pieces in there. There was one like, um, like highly finished, really big, like quasi biblical, very mythical uh, pencil drawing in there. I forget who did it, but uh, that one was really like, whoa, that's an awesome piece. There was a lot of great stuff, but of course that one stands out because I do big finished pencil drawings too, so I'm very sensitive to those.
Angel says, hello, Stephen. What to do about feeling like the drawings, paintings I'm doing are just not good enough. I feel like I don't have a good taste to create art. Uh, they, not to pop your balloon or anything, but they aren't. They aren't good enough. And that's not a big deal. It just isn't a big deal. Your, your imagination and your taste are always going to exceed what you are capable of producing with your hand. And that's not a failure. That's not a negative. That is the unavoidable way of things. That is what keeps you progressing forever, you know, possibly for a lifetime, rather than, you know, crossing the finish line at some point and being like, ah, I've unified my taste in my hand, I'm done. You know, like, no, the, the horizon keeps receding and that's what makes art the kind of thing you can, it's, it's such a special thing, you know, it's, it's, there's very few other things like it. You can really just keep sinking into it and getting better at it for a lifetime, which is rare. There's very few creative marathons like that. It's not a bad thing. It's just the way things go. It's the way things are. You keep drawing. The Usually what's messing people up when they're having feelings like yours is this this deep-seated assumption that their work is supposed to be great. Now, why would that be? Have you practiced for 45 years? Have you investigated the fine details of all of the fundamentals? Have you attempted your dream pieces 200 times, 300 times? If you haven't, why are you surprised that the work is not great? It shouldn't be. It would be a tear in the fabric of reality if it was, in spite of these things being missing. None of this is a failure. None of this is outside of the natural order. This is the rightful consequence of where you are in your life at this point. Don't worry about it. Just keep making the bad pieces. Keep attempting the dream pieces because the good ones are, can only be on the other side of the attempts. So keep trying. That's all I'm doing. I'm, I'm just attempting the dream pieces over and over and over again. You know, and I'm giving it my all. I've been doing this a long time. I've probably only got, you know, prob probably, if I'm really strict with myself, I've probably got less than 40 attempts under my belt. I mean, it's not easy. They take a lot out of you, but I don't think 40 is enough. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I hope to make several hundred attempts. And I, I'm telling you, all of my improvement, my real improvement, the improvements that I remember, the improvements that are clear, the jumps are not from studies, they're not from thousands of spheres, they're, they're, those contribute, those help a little bit. Um, they're not from millions of sketches like this, which I've done, it's from the finished pieces, the real attempts. Those are what have made me better.
Wake V says, yo, Steven, went full-time freelance a few months ago and feel a little guilt every time I see the girlfriend leave for work. I still work all day, but just get to stay in the house. Ever experienced this feeling? Um, yeah, but don't don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That that guilt is that guilt's not about what's actually going on. That that guilt is yeah. You probably have a guilt complex that you're used to running, right? I know I do. Um, that's just conditioned by your past and your culture, and the structure around sort of leaving for work and being at the office and all of that, you know, that, that sort of being, when put against what you're doing, being just any kind of hierarchy being created there is socially constructed. Um, and let me tell you, someone who has been doing this a, a lot, a long time, you know, working from home um, and, and being in a relationship with someone who leaves for work and things like that, uh, the situation can switch as in they, they, they can look at you and feel guilty that they get to go to an office and see human beings and not spend eight hours a day alone in their room, just going insane with their own thoughts. Like the, it, the opposite can be seen to be true. It's all lenses. It's all lenses. Don't worry about it. Sorry, the lighting keeps changing on the drawing today. I'm working by window light today instead of by my my lights lights, my standing lights. Katie says, hey, Steve, how to strike a balance when using very organic forms and patterns and designing them to fit inside your illustration work? Hard to find the sweet spot. Um, I mean, yeah, if, if you look at um, sort of the current style, not styles, but just like the current just the way illustrations look these days, they tend to be light on organics. You know, thing, figures tend to mostly be covered by clothes. Um, you know, it's really just more about the primary shapes of the anatomy underneath, but in most like commercial illustration work, there's a lot more going on than just organic forms and things like that, you know? And yeah, there's only so much you could do to resist that if you're working in that realm, you know? It, it can look a little, it can look a little old timey these days if you sort of shoehorn the anatomy in there uh, and forego the, the clothing and the armor and all of these other things that people have really come to expect in the current zeitgeist of illustration. Um, so I don't know, don't, don't shoehorn it. You know, sometimes that's not the right fit. That's all right. You know, I love doing my personal work and my my personal drawings because it's it's all up to me. I'm not re I'm not really trying to 
align with the current commercial climate. So just naked creatures and figures all the time. I have every opportunity I could want to do organic forms. But yeah, sometimes it's just not the right fit. You could certainly find a way to make it work, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> you you teach us all. You find the way to do it and uh, then explain how you did it to everybody. Bye, Emma. Thanks for being here. Steven, how come people suggest beginners, intermediate artists to put quantity over slow finished pieces? Uh, I mean, it depends what you're going for. Um, I think a lot of that, a lot of that advice, the quantity advice comes from the commercial art background. I'm from that background, so I'm not saying that pejoratively or anything like that. But, um, I think it's just born from a particular place and for a while, you know, past, you know, 15 years or something like that. Um, the energy around being a commercial artist in the parts of commercial art where you would ever draw was very generalized. It was very much about having a general skill set, a general capacity, sort of being very broad and that lack of specificity sort of makes it so that one of the few generally applicable piece of it, pieces of advice you could give was draw a lot, <laughs> draw a ton. Um, and that is basically what most drawing advice online for people who wanted to get good at drawing and stuff like that has been for the past 15 years or so like that. You know, we've, we've embroidered it every goddamn which way and elaborated on it in every which way. But if you boil it down, everyone's basically advising each other to draw and don't stop drawing. Um, but yeah, it, it's born from the commercial mindset of deadlines, of having to slide from one picture to the next, having to do a lot of iterations, you know, give people options, things to choose from, things like that. Um, like all things, it's construct, it's conditioning. It will change, it is changing now, I think. Uh, it's only relevant in a particular game that people are playing. And it is not the case that the way people have improved at drawing through all of history is sheer volume. It's just, it only achieves, a. it only obtains to a particular kind of work. And a lot of commercial artists have suffered the consequences of that. I mean, if you listen to a lot of commercial artists who have, you know, left the industry or changed industries, you know, just changed something about their pursuits, a lot of them describe sort of the pain of, you know, being unable to guide themselves and to focus on their own creativity. A lot of them have a lot of trouble finishing things and things like that. Um, Finish does make you better. It makes you better, faster at certain things than drawing a lot does. Most people need a mix of both, and the mix that you need is, you know, it comes down to you, the individual, but you got to play with it. If you never finish things, if you never spend a lot of time on something, I think you should try it. And you're if you if you 
really never do it. You are closing off a, a whole huge swath of art to yourself. You know, the pieces that I like to make, for example, I can only make them look the way that I like if I spend multiple weeks on them. And, you know, the only way to practice spending multiple weeks on them is to spend multiple weeks on them. That may seem so obvious as to be beneath mention, but it's amazing how many people don't understand that. Wufo says, Stephen, I always forced myself to study what I thought I should be doing. I would get terrified of actually doing my pieces, so I never did one. But finally, since this year, with your help, I got over that hurdle. I'm finally doing art without creeping anxiety. I cannot thank you enough. I love it. I love to hear it. That's fantastic. I'm very happy for you, Wufo. And I'm happy to help. Happy to have helped however I did. I'm really gravitating towards this branches on the outside being sort of a cage for the foliage thing. Just putting it through its paces, looking for different configurations of that, but that base idea is really sticking with me. It's what you see there, what you see here. What I'm doing a little thumbnail for here. Curse Fita says, how do you deal with the attention, not becoming arrogant? Uh, I mean, I, I just try not to resist it. I'm, I just let myself be hugely arrogant. I just really let it just wash over me and transform me. I just really don't fight it at all. It's really messed up. I just like, <laughs> yeah, it's so bad. I just, I genuinely think I'm one of the best artists in the world. It's horrible. And I just like let myself feel really good about that I've been able to help people. Oh, and that people value my work. It's really, really bad.
yeah, I never really even stood a, a chance. I just, I really just very much like a very, very bad person. Just, I just let myself become hugely, hugely arrogant. It sucks. I'm just like, it sucks. I'm like getting a little overwhelmed right now talking about it. It's just like I'm just like bristling with confidence. Just like ne never waste my time worrying that I'm bad at art or that I'm doing the wrong thing. It's like, it sucks. Do you ever color your hair? Uh, I don't know. I never have. I don't think I would mind if it went gray. Hi, YOLO. Streetcar says, Hi, Steve. I recently had the uncanny and painful experience of people calling my art AI. I've been a professional illustrator for years now, and I would never use AI. I know I said I wasn't going to talk about AI, but this seems like a unusual and rare circumstance. I've seen every video you have done about it and thought I had the tools to emotionally process what happened. Some of the things you've said on those videos, I still keep as mantras in my head. I'm glad. I'm glad they've been able to help. Despite that though, seeing multiple people call my painting AI generated was incredibly painful. I don't know how to word the question exactly. I just wanted to know your thought experience. Well, I haven't had that experience personally. Uh, I have heard of a few people who that has happened to. Um, it's unfortunate. It does suck, but you know, just, just remember like they're wrong. They're wrong. You, you didn't, you did make the picture, you know, that, that let that strengthen you, you know, that should give you a great inner steel. You know, this is not like a, it's an interesting and novel situation and a particularly painful one for an artist to be in, but it's not a nuanced situation in this case. They are incorrect, you know? Um, you may be worried that it sort of says something about your style or something like that. Like I, I've seen some people struggle with that. Like, oh crap, does the way that I work sort of had this have this inherently AI look? And I don't think that's the case. I think what you need to remember there is that of course people's work looks like AI. AI is based on our work. So of course there's going to be a huge and significant overlap. So it is just not your fault and it's not your problem. It's AI's problem. Um, I don't know, what would I do? I'd probably delete the messages. Well, you, usually I don't delete anything just because I don't care, you know, but if, if something like that, that is so clearly wrong really troubled me like that and I had some worries about it, who cares if you delete the messages? Like the, the internet is a, a joke. <laughs> the internet's a joke and internet dramas like that are just not a big deal. So if you have like career or business concerns about like, oh man, those comments sitting there and um, what if people who might hire me, because you said you're a professional illustrator, what if they think I'm using AI and I'm not? Yeah, that's a real concern. And guess what? You're not using AI. so. Delete the messages. Make it like it never happened. Who cares? They're wrong. It'd be different if this was a more nuanced situation where like 
I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've seen a lot of nuanced situations, like lots of big illustrators using it and having, you know, really long protracted debates and back and forth with their audience. But in this situation, they are just incorrect. So, you know, just do whatever it takes to reduce your suffering around it. I mean, the suffering's not adding anything to the world, either on your side or the other side. So just cut it off, cut it off. Yeah, like Charlie Wing said, AI looks like our art, not the other way around. Um, I'm going to leave this here because I have to go in 10 minutes to move my car, and we've been going for two hours, so I think I'm just going to Seems like a convenient and appropriate time to cut the stream for today. And, you know, I got a page of ideas out, and as you all know, I, I like to end a session on. I like to end a session where I know what I would do the next time I sit down, and I feel like I like this idea. Not this particular sketch, but the, the branches hugging the foliage into the interior. I like that. That's here, 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 and here. So when I sit down again, I'll do that. So let me just get to some of these questions for the last 10 minutes here. Vishwam Ohana says, I got really bad feedback on my art, after which I feel quite discouraged to draw on a regular basis. Picking up the pen pencil causes quite a bit of anxiety. Any advice on putting that behind? Thanks. I've been teaching for years. I have taught students for free, for money. I've taught them independently. I've taught them in college where I need to grade them, and I'm giving them passing grades that accredit them towards degrees. I have never ever given mean, discouraging feedback. It's not a failing on you. It's a failing on the person who gave you feedback. They don't know how to manage their emotions or they're just a thoughtless loser. It's not hard. It's the easiest thing in the world to not give discouraging feedback that would produce the exact result that you're talking about, where you have anxiety when you pick up the pen or pencil. I tell you right now, it is not your fault at all I'm not telling you to go argue with them or go find that person. Dump it. Dump it. Leave it behind. Drop it like it never happened. It's useless. It is not your problem. People like that are used to letting their shitty, ill-considered little words worm their way into people's heads. They're manipulators. They're not emotionally mature. They're just a very common kind of person in the world. It's not special. It's not interesting. I don't care if they're the head of an art department. I, I, I'd say it to their face. You know, you're, you're lacking something. You, you missed some important life lessons. It doesn't matter what their position is, what their station is. It doesn't matter if they're a great artist. It doesn't matter if they're your hero. In that regard, they don't know what they're doing, and they're a fool. You leave it behind like it never happened. It's their problem, not yours. Thank you, Ariel. Will you not explain what these trees are for? I'm just working on next personal drawing. I've been wanting to do a tree for a long time, though. You know, that's an idea I've been banding around for a long time. But yeah, it's just another personal drawing.
Thank you, Cursed Fetus. Cursed Fetus says, God bless your kneecaps, sire. Makes me feel good. They need blessings. I might take the kneecaps on a little run later today. They need to hold up. Whoa, my watch died. I gotta charge that. Steven was wondering, how do you keep yourself from overworking? I love art and I don't mind working extensive hours, but sometimes I feel like I should take a break, but would feel guilty if I did. That's just guilt process running. The, I mean, it should be obvious. The only way you keep yourself from overworking is you don't overwork. You just cap it. That's it, you know? And expect that capping it will make your life more difficult. Culture is going to push back on that. Our society is all messed up right now. You know, it, it doesn't... Our society is so limited right now that the, the, the culture doesn't know anything, doesn't know what else to say to you other than work your ass off. That's all culture knows how to say to you right now. Um, so just know that you're going to be pushing back against that and there's going to be some friction. Um, but you just don't do it. You don't overwork. I, I, I personally, I, I'm always working with a timer. You can see it here. I turned it on when I started streaming, so it's at two hours and five minutes right now. For my drawing, I just put a cat, I try not to work more than four hours, no matter what's going on. Don't put out as much work. Miss a YouTube video this week. Projects taking longer than you imagined. Oh well. That's all I can say, oh well. Sorry. Oh, am I in trouble? Oh, whoops. What's your thoughts on trees? I think they're great. <laughs> Tippin says, I can't draw this shit. How the fuck do I do that? I like that comment. I like just looking at someone's drawings and going, I can't draw this shit. <laughs> That was awesome. Uh, Anali says, any advice on overcoming plateaus? Finish pieces. That's all, that's all that's ever done it for me. You just finish them. Daryl Grant says, not much of a question, just to say that I'm working on a piece that has had me excitedly anticipating coming back to my desk every day. Just want to say thanks for your constant reminder to do what we love. Love to hear it, Daryl. Oh, there's no better feeling. That's why I love as often as I can, as much as I can manage, it's hard to do, but, you know, getting on, getting drawings going that I know will take a month, it's such a pleasure because then once it's on the final sheet and I'm like, all right, we're finishing this one. It's taped off. Here we go. It's like <laughs> that month is just so delicious, you know, really just grants a, a divine and beautiful energy to that month, you know, just... Every day, know what I'm going back to, know what I'm going back to, picking away at it. Have you ever destroyed a piece of art intentionally? I'm sure at some point. Do you have any source suggestions for learning history and culture of knight armors? I'm not a historian by any means, but the, the Osprey publishing books have been very useful to me. Uh, and there's a guy on YouTube called Knight Errant. I think knight is with a Y. He should pop up. He should pop up if you type anything similar to Knight Errant. Errant, like E-R-R-A-N-T, something like that. His YouTube channel is very good. And you'll find on his YouTube channel links to some Pinterest boards that he curates that has all historically accurate armor. No problem, Cloverburn. Just got a couple minutes here. Stevo LeBlanc said, a famous art, comic artist that I had the luck to meet in person when I was 17 looked at my drawings and with a pitiful face just said, I don't know, it's nothing special. It hurt me so badly that I stopped drawing for years. 
Now, 15 years later, I still like to think that every small achievement is a big F you. These people are trash. Thanks to you for reminding your audience that. Yeah, it's just the fact that you're a great artist does not mean you have any wisdom. They're separate things. I uh, feel very lucky that I've taught enough people and been through enough of that myself that I just saw very early on the real damage that that has done to people in their lives. So that just made it very easy to avoid it. You know, I have some compassion for these people. Most of them would be horrified to know the extent to which they have harmed people, you know, because they're walking around thinking of themselves as these very banal sort of nice people who haven't caused much harm in the world, you know, the way that we all tend to walk around. We all, you know, sort of bless ourselves with a new kind of a neutral stance most of the time. They would be horrified to know. So I have a little compassion for them. But yeah, they're fucking up left and right. Thank you for introducing me to Alan Watts, Stephen. Oh, enjoy, Charlie. Enjoy. Do you post your streams after the fact? They all sit on the channel. If you just go to the live tab on the um, on my channel, they're all there. Every one I've ever done. There's a lot of good questions, but I got to look for some short stuff because I've only got a few minutes here before I got to go. Mustafa says, Stephen, I seek your guidance for near a year. I've progressed so far in my art that it has become something to behold. Nice. <laughs> However, the feeling of shit and just not being enough doesn't leave. It's not about the art. That stuff is never in the art. It really has nothing to do with the art. It is possible to make the worst garbage art in the world and feel great about it and yourself. So it's not about the art. That's stuff that is unresolved within you, within your heart. And there's, there's nothing but progress that we need to make on ourselves and things, new things that we need to resolve inside in our internality. But, um, Real progress can be made there. But trust me, it's not about the art. You, you, you've you got to, you don't need to do it through the art. You know, at, at that point, you, you can take your inquiry elsewhere, to a journal, to meditation, to wherever the right place, is, therapy, wherever the right place is for you to investigate that question. But it's not about the art anymore. It's about you. You know, you're not being compassionate towards yourself. You're not treating yourself the way you would treat a friend you're just lacking patience with yourself and that people have that for all sorts of different reasons, um, but you need to investigate it. <clears throat> How do I feel like I've achieved something whenever I spend time working on some art? Well, you have achieved something. That's an easy one. Easy question. Boom. Got it. Done. Nailed. One sentence. We will see Beard Steven in next stream. I don't know. I might shave it before next stream. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Dark. All right, everybody. I'm gonna wrap up here, I gotta go. I will see you all again soon. I had a nice little break from streaming, but I'm happy to be doing it again. Um, I got some videos in the can. There's a bunch of videos coming out on the channel. I think right now we've got three in the can. You know, if you're a patron, you have early access to two of them. I think the third one that's in the can is being finalized still. But um, if you're on the Patreon, uh, you have early access to those already. Those will be coming out over the next few weeks. Um, one of those is going to be a Patreon Q&A. Well, actually one of the videos is one of the Patreon Q&A questions that was pulled out on its own. 
Um, the spirituality video that we just had was one of those, but there was another one that I pulled out on its own. And then there's a separate video that is the rest of the Patreon Q&A questions um, answered together. So uh, those will be coming out soon. And if you're interested in asking questions in the future and having them answered in a YouTube video, consider joining the Patreon. And uh, what else? What else? What else do I have to say? What other housekeeping do I have? Goodbye, Joe. Joe says, bye, and may the specter of alternate side parking haunt you never again, if only, if only. If there was like a, I wish there was like a one-time donation you could make to the city so that you never had to do alternate side again. Like, I bet they'd make a lot of money off of that. Like just, <laughs> if it was just like, you pay New York City like $5,000 once, and then you get a special license plate where you can't get tickets for alternate side. <sighs> Dude, I'd do it. I would absolutely do it. Um, yeah, I don't think I have any other housekeeping. Yeah, so I'll see you guys again soon. Watch out for those videos coming out. And um, take care, everybody. Goodbye to Madrigal, Cloverburn, Daryl Grant, Martin the Goat, Ego Kid, Not This Brain, Angel Lorenzo Lopez, A underscore, Fier, Manuel, Froggy, Sweet Joseph Marziliano, Tumas 53, Kumo, Juxun, Juxun. Arcane, Mr. Soon Cloody, Angel, Librate, Tanish Naudo, Steve O. LeBlanc, Tired Ennio, Yankee Art, Tanish Naidu, Frequency Zero, Rafael S. Norona, GG's, is that hair real? You betcha. All right, everybody, take care. I will see you again soon. Happy drawing until next time.